Hi guys and welcome back to the early bird photo news. As you can see, after two months on the road driving on more than 8,000 kilometers through some of the most stunning habitat in far north Queensland, I've made it back to the Gold Coast for now. One thing I found on my desk I'm very proud of are these really cool stamps. Let's try that again. One thing I had on my desk when I came home were these really cool Australia Post stamps with some of my photos on them. I've always collected bird stamps, especially parrot stamps. So I'm quite excited to finally have my own photos on some official stamps and on this cool coin as well. And I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to see how some of my photos actually end up. I would have never thought that out of all the images I've ever taken, orange-footed scrub fowl and brush turkeys, make it on a stamp but i won't say no i'm very happy that they actually made it and these stamps look awesome last night i also finished to go through the last of the over 100,000 images that i took on my road trip and out of those 120 odd thousand images i kept around 8,300. well that's still a big number but i often keep images for education purposes or if i keep a few different poses or for instance i have a series of flight shots where i only added one image but i want to keep the whole series of images in case i want to use it in a future video for instance so i usually keep a few more images than most people however out of those 8,300 images, I might edit 20 to 30 images. So my final hit rate out of 100 or 120,000 images is probably 0.2% or something. So a very low kind of hit rate of images that actually make it through to being edited into final images. But at the same time, I wouldn't be able to get those special keeper shots if I didn't take all these other images in between that I have to delete because Without taking so many shots, I would often miss the crucial moment that I really want to capture. I'm very glad that I have found Fast on Image Viewer many years ago. It's free and it allows me to tag all the images that I want to keep, look at them easily at 100% and then delete all the untagged images very quickly. And so I'm able to work through 20, 30,000 images in just a few hours. A lot of you guys also wanted to know how I back up my images in the field. And first of all, I take a big DAS system, a direct attached storage system with me that has four 18 terabyte drives in there in a RAID system. So that has all my images on it, also all the files that I might need to access in the field. That's the first backup. Then I take a bunch of these four terabyte Western Digital SSD drives with me. They have the, just the images from the trip on them and some other smaller files. And then I also take enough memory cards that I don't actually have to format them in the field. So I had like, I think 10 CF Express cards with me, large enough to hold all my files so I didn't have to format a single card. And because I was shooting in C-RAW, I could on a one terabyte card take almost 20,000 images. So it turned out to be fine. And it, that's my third kind of dirty backup where I just keep all the files. And it also stops me from accidentally formatting a card in the field that I haven't downloaded yet. So with that system, I've been working quite well. And I'm very happy that I've found these Wise Advanced cards because they've been very reliable and not too expensive. So I was able to take enough cards with me in the field. In the past, I always took a lot of heavy, bigger backpacks with me. But on this trip, I actually enjoyed the most my relatively small f-stop guru ultra light backpack and that backpack fits an amazing amount of gear i fit in an r3 with a 24 to 105 an r5 with battery grip and 100 to 500 my ninja recording screen and a second r5 or an r3 my flashes and a few smaller things like secateurs and cable ties and all of that in this tiny package, well, it doesn't look as tiny on the screen, but it's actually not that big in real life. So the R3 with the 24-105 goes in here. And then in the back, I have all the other stuff, R5, 100-500, and a few more spots for some cameras and other gear. All in all, a great backpack that allows me to take all the things I need for a quick shoot into the field with me. And... I also have on the side this Gizzo GT2545 if I want to film myself in the field with the R3 and the 24 to 105. So that has basically stayed packed in my car the whole time and whatever I needed to go out somewhere, I just grabbed this backpack and I knew I had everything with me. 
And if I felt like taking my big 600 millimeter lens, I actually don't put it in a backpack anymore. I put it on the tripod and then carry it on my shoulders. Here's some exciting news for all R7 owners or future R7 owners out there. And that's that DxO Pure Raw is now supporting the R7. I've tested it on a few files and it does a great job. If you don't have an R7 yet or want to play around with some of my higher ISO files, I've linked a few R7 RAW files down there for you in the description where you can download them and put them through Pure RAW for instance and play around with them, see how they edit up for you. And if you're a new R7 owner, I've also linked an R7 setup guide for you down there in the description that helps you to set up your R7 for success. I want to show you a Sunbird example now where you can see exactly why I love DX or Pure Raw and my Pro sets to get my Raw files to a fantastic starting point. And you will also see why I always say that you should not judge noise in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. Because this is the Sunbird image with the Adobe standard settings and no noise reduction applied and we see some not great colors and some awful noise in the file. However, here now we have the same file run through DxO Pure Raw and now all the noise is gone. It was shot at ISO 3200 and we have some nice clean details left. However, the colors still look a little bit funny. So this is where my Pro Sets come in. In this case, I selected the vibrant darker Pro Set and with just one click, I now have a noise free image that also has fantastic colors. And all I need to do now is apply my workflow that I teach you step by step in my masterclass. And I come up with this beautiful final image of the Sunbird. Noise free and great colors. And if you want to learn all about my Pro Sets and my masterclass, make sure to check them out down there in the description as well. Last week, we're talking about Canon pulling the firmware for the R3. And they did because there was some issue that if you installed a new firmware and then factory reset the camera that it kind of got stuck or got just not destroyed but didn't really work properly anymore. So they pulled the firmware but they released a fix now and I've installed it and obviously it's working fine now. I didn't try to reset it because why would you reset your camera after installing the firmware anyways. But for now all R3 users there's a new firmware that you can find for your R3. I've installed it on my camera because I want to use all the new cool features, but I can also understand if people want to wait that little bit longer. This week, there have been some wild rumors about a Nikon Z8 coming out in August. So pretty much any day now with the same sensor and same processor of the Z9. Now that's not really a surprise because everyone expects the Z8 to be a mini Z9, kind of like a Z9 with no battery grip and a few dints from the cripple hammer that will hit it like a smaller buffer and less video features. But overall, a very similar camera to the Z9 in a smaller body at a slightly smaller price point. So I guess now that the Z9 orders are being fulfilled more, more and more and probably going down in volume, I guess it could make sense to release a Z8 soon. Although to me personally, it still feels early. The Z9 hasn't even been out for a full year yet, I think. So already pushing out another camera might feel a little bit soon. But on the other hand, if it's a great camera, and I think it will be, it might be even more interesting to a lot of Nikon shooters than the actual Z9, unless they really need that heavy, rugged body. What do you think? Are you more interested in a slightly cheaper Z8 or the Z9? Make sure to let me know in the comments. Another rumor that was circulating was that instead of the Z8, we're going to see a Z6 III, a successor to the Z6 II. And personally, I think that may make a lot more sense because I think the Z6 II and the Z7 II definitely need an upgrade. What are some of the features you would want to see in a Z6 II other than better autofocus? Make sure to let me know in the comments. Like always, we don't have any Sony news because their gear must just be perfect and there's no updates needed. Overall, the last few weeks have been very quiet when it comes to camera news and rumors or releases of gear. The R7 was the really big hide kind of piece of equipment and we saw some cool new Nikon lenses coming, but since then it has been very quiet. One item I definitely want to see soon, I'm very excited about even though I'm not a Nikon shooter, is the 200 to 600 that Nikon still has on their roadmap. If it's anywhere 
as good as the Sony and priced reasonably well as well, it would be a fantastic lens for so many Nikon shooters. So this is one of the lenses I'm definitely looking forward. When it comes to Canon, I would love to see a 300 to 600 or 200 to 500 f4 with a built-in 1.4 extender because I think that would be a fantastic flexible lens for video and people that are on safaris for instance. When it comes to cameras what I really want to see is an R1 in an R3 body with 50 megapixels. The blueprint is there for Canon so please give it to us. Although I must say after the latest update to the R5 where it doesn't overheat as much anymore the need for an R1 has slightly decreased for me but I still think when I'm traveling to the hot tropics again later in the year having a camera that doesn't overheat as much is more reliable and a better weather sealed body would definitely be beneficial but we probably have to wait until next year for the other one and since there's not that many news this week and i still need to edit so many more videos let's wrap up the early bird photo news for this week here i hope you enjoyed it and like always please make sure to give me a thumbs up for this video let me know all your thoughts in the comments and subscribe to the channel down there and i will see you in the next video very soon. Bye guys.